It's my very great pleasure to welcome you all to the Runciman Award Ceremony 2023, featuring a keynote uh, speech by Professor Mary Beard on the topic, how do we best argue for classics? Something that I know is uh, very close to the hearts of many of us in this room, and I think an incredibly important topic for this contemporary moment. Um, welcome to all of you who've traveled from afar, all of you who've traveled on sweaty tube trains from much closer to home, and a particular warm and, and warm welcome for our very special guest, His Royal Highness, Prince Michael of Kent, who is the chief patron and president of the Anglo-Hellenic League. So, Professor Mary Beard will be introduced to you probably by our next speaker, but I just want to say a very few words about this Runciman event series. It's a series of enormous importance to us here at King's, and it's a source of great pride and delight, particularly for the community that gathers regularly around this event and the very warm community that we've got here this evening. And the award ceremony is co-organized between King's Center for Hellenic Studies and, of course, its collaboration with the Anglo-Hellenic League, a very long-standing collaboration and one that's been an incredibly generative one, a really productive one over the years. And this collaboration, these events have put King's at the very heart of Hellenic studies in London and in the UK. And it's, again, an enormous sense of pride and um, great warm feeling to everybody who's made that possible over the last very many years, actually. So thank you for being with us tonight for what promises to be an exceptional event. And thank you, last but not least, to Gonda Van Steen, who orchestrates this all absolutely magnificently every year. Um, and, and we owe so much to you, Gonda, for this. So with that, I'm going to hand over now to the very safe hands of Dr. John Kitmer, Chair of the Council of the League, who will introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you, John. Your Royal Highness, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, um, I've now been chairing the Council of the League for five years. Um, because of COVID, this is my fifth uh, opportunity to uh, say a few introductory words about what is our annual flagship event. It's wonderful to see so many people here tonight, and I know there are many watching online as well. Um, we seem gradually to be emerging from COVID, and we had record registrations to attend this evening, and brilliantly, you all seem to have turned up, which is fantastic. So thank you, Apokadias, from my heart. This has been, as we all know, a very turbulent year in Britain and in Greece, not the only turbulent year in the past decade, but here in the UK, we've had two new prime ministers, one new monarch. In Greece, the electoral cycle is in full swing, even as I speak. An inconclusive poll in May will be followed at the end of this week with a second ballot under a different electoral regulation. Political life in our two countries has been and continues to be febrile. Well, the Anglo-Hellenic League Runciman Award allows us to step back from the immediacy of today's politics to take a longer view, a more considered view. Across the year, the League tries, through our events program, to cast expert light on different aspects of Greece and Hellenism and the Anglophone world's interest, abiding interest, in them. Since we last met, our program has looked at fragile ecosystems in northwest Greece, the life of the only Greek Archbishop of Canterbury, St. Theodore of Tarsus, Edinburgh as the Athens of the North, the work of the British School at Athens. Recently, we've introduced to a London audience a new Greek detective novel and new English translations and visualizations 
of the work of the great poet Yanis Ritsos. We haven't neglected either the broad perspectives of Greek political scientists. The Runciman Award is very much part of that core business of spreading the word about Greece and explaining Britain's interest and the Anglophone world's interest in Greece and Hellenism. The aim of the award is quite simple. We want to put on display the very best writing, the very best contemporary writing in English about Greece to show something of the diversity of that writing and to celebrate the achievements of the authors and the translators and publishers. In our shortlisted and winning books, we're looking for writing that not only inspires individual readers, but which causes such readers to transmit their inspiration and enthusiasm to others. You know, or at least I know, that I'm reading a potential Runciman winner when I find myself saying to friends or to colleagues or some poor innocent booby on the train who's never met me before, you must read this book. You really must read this book. This is the test of the Runciman Award, readability, inspiration, transmission. It's a great honor and pleasure to be joined here tonight by our chief patron and president, His Royal Highness, Prince Michael of Kent, who has encouraged and supported the league for many years and who will make tonight's presentation to the winner. We're very grateful for your presence, sir. Let me thank Professor Thane for her generous and warm words in welcoming us all here this evening. Um, as she said, with more modesty than I like to say it, uh, Kings and the LSE across the road have always been important to the League. We wouldn't exist without these two organisations. They're our founding organisations, and both of them are represented on our council today. Uh, Kevin Featherstone from the LSE uh, rep represents um, informally, because it's not a formal representation, but he's a, a voice of the LSE on the council. And of course, Professor Gonda van Steen, the Korais Professor, Director of the Centre for Hellenic Studies. I particularly want to thank Gonda to add to the thanks that Marion has already expressed uh, for all of the work that she does on the council, for helping us come up with and then implement the joint events that the League uh, and the Centre for Hellenic Studies do together. Uh, and of course, many thanks for your hard work for this evening's uh, celebration. Now, Peter Frankopan, the Chair of Judges, will talk later about uh, the shortlisted books, and I will talk a bit later about Peter Frankopan as well, because I will take the microphone to do so. Nice words, Peter, don't worry. Um, but I want to add my Congratulations to all of the shortlisted authors uh, and their publishers. Four of the shortlisted authors are with us here tonight. Uh, congratulations to you all, they're fantastic books. Welcome to you all. It's really great pleasure to have you here with us tonight. I want to close this very brief introduction by thanking our magnificent sponsors, the Levendis Foundation, who are represented here tonight in the front row, um, and the Lascarides Foundation, who I know are watching us online. Um, without support from the two foundations, we would be unable to put on our events program, and we would certainly be unable uh, to put up an annual book prize of £10,000. So thank you uh, to both foundations for all your work. Um, I have to say, you're fantastic sponsors, you're easy to deal with, you come and support the events, you love the events that we do, and as a result of this, we love you, so thank you very much. <laughs> Just a little word of warning, we have an ace photographer here this evening. Um, we are in the process of um, uh, finalizing a new website, which will look, make us look like an organization that really does exist in the 21st and not the 20th century. Um, the photographs we're going to take tonight, um, we do plan to use as many of them as possible on the new website so that people get a sense of the events we hold. If you know when your photograph is being taken that you really don't want it to appear, please do uh, let our photographer know, um, or let me know, or Rula Konzotis, uh, uh, who's sitting in the second row here, let us know that you'd rather uh, not uh, be public. Um, of course, we hope you will, because your support uh, for events like this is at the core of what we do. Well, it's now my huge pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Mary Beard, 
It's one of Britain's most recognized and admired classicists, a rock star classicist, appearing regularly on TV and radio, talk, talking and lecturing across the globe, blogging with commanding assurance, producing a great stream of thought-provoking, eye-catching, prize-winning books, Pompeii, SPQR, Women and Power, 12 Caesars. We have them, most of us here, I'm sure, we have them on our shelves. Mary also has a truly impressive string of accolades to her name, not least in being a rare example of a classics dame, which she's been since 2018. Her next book, On the World of the Roman Emperor, is coming out, I think, in the autumn, it's certainly keenly awaited. Tonight, she's going to talk to us on a subject that preoccupies many of us here, how, we, how do we best argue for classics. Mary, thank you for being our guest speaker. The floor's yours. Hello. Um, I am sure that uh, some people, many people in the audience, will have seen a headline in the Times last week, which ran, we should cheer the decline of humanities degrees. This turned out to be a rather different spin on that mini media industry that often produces many column inches on how the humanities are going down the tube, right? how enrolments, even in such old stalwarts as English literature, are falling, how, st how students are voting with their feet and defecting to more relevant subjects, and so on. Now, normally, these articles are exercises in gloomy hand-wringing and I think it was only in the case of the Times journalist, a kind of cheap desire to put a new spin on the story, rather desperately, that she chose to present this as the humanities are going down the tube and a jolly good thing too, was the tendency of the argument. Now, I always think we have to be a bit careful about this kind of argument. There are all kinds of problems with the health of the humanities in the UK. We know that some departments have been closed, that academics are increasingly employed on lousy, precarious, temporary contracts. And again, it was last week, at the same time as this Times article, that the British Academy produced a frank report, and not wholly optimistic, about the varied fate of English degrees across the British Isles. At the same time, I think, protestations of despair do tend to be a bit hardwired into the humanities. We're always thinking that our subjects flourished more luxuriously in the old days, right? I always remember how struck I was when I discovered that our National Classical Association was founded in 1903 with the express purpose of defending the study of Greek and Latin, which was then thought to be in its death throes. Now, for us, looking back, 1903 seems to be the kind of middle of the self-confident glory days of classics, but they didn't think so. And there is, I think, a sense for us, you know, that I think people have been lamenting our command and familiarity with Latin and Greek since the second century CE, probably, if not before. So I think we have to be a bit careful about this. But all the same, I think there is a kind of wake-up call here for those of us who are engaged in the study of ancient Greek and Roman culture. Wake-up call to think a bit harder about how we would actually stand up to that kind of Times article without simply saying, oh, there's wonderful literature and art, right? 
how do we explain what we think classics is for and why it is so important and what kind of arguments that are trotted out are actually quite bad ones in that respect. And so that's what I'm going to try to do briefly today. Now, I don't for a minute believe that the health of Hellenic studies, ancient and modern, is solely dependent on what goes on in schools and universities. Um, the short list for the prize, if nothing else, shows that that's not true. But schools and universities are what I know about, and they're going to be what I mostly concentrate on this evening. And I'm also, for the same reason, because I know about it, going to be thinking mostly about this country. Now, as with many subjects, classics has a reach across half the globe, but also it has very different national traditions and micro divides. And I hope that people will put me right afterwards and say from an outside perspective where the kind of view I get from the UK doesn't actually fly if we look at other, uh, other areas of the globe. So um, please don't feel that you have to take what I say um, as, as kind of universally true. It's a very partial view. So a few weeks ago, uh, I did a bit of an experiment and I tried putting the question of why study classics to the web. In particular, I went to classics promo websites of university departments here on both sides of the Atlantic, almost all of which have some kind of subsection aimed at potential students headed why classics, right? Now, to be fair, a few of them were actually quite good. But most were somewhere on the spectrum between dreary and absolutely dreadful, right? One American university, for example, boasted, apparently, that classics would help you at med school as you would already be familiar with some of the Greek terminology, right? as if classics was a degree in bloody vocabulary, you know? It reminded me a bit of those old arguments about why study Latin, you know, because it will make it much easier to learn French, which is sort of true, but it's even easier to learn French if you learn French, you know? <laughs> not, to do, not Latin first, for heaven's sake. And even in departments where I knew for a fact that most of the academic staff were extremely suspicious of the old Plato to NATO narrative, there was an awful lot of the wellsprings of Western civilization knocking around and woolly claims about the timeless truths you would be learning if you came to study classics. I don't think anyone who does study classics thinks that they uh, are a repository of timeless truths. In fact, we try to say exactly the opposite, I think. But that was the line. And much of this online PR was sprinkled with a kind of language of love and passion, right? Your teachers, they assured the potential student, your teachers will love classics, Right? Occasionally, much more implausibly, they said they will love the Greeks and Romans. That's something I've always found quite hard to do. Um, they will teach you, and this is a direct quote, to love words. Now, in a way, that's quite harmless stuff, a bit of enthusiasm. It, as I was reading more and more of it, it really raised my hackles. I do classics, I think, because it challenges me, because it destabilizes me, it baffles me a bit, it engages my interest, my expertise, and my brain, right? I don't do it because I love it, right? So you don't, for example, go up to a virologist and ask, do you love viruses? <laughs> you don't go up to an astrophysicist and say, do you love black holes, right? So don't ask me that was what the kind of message I came away with. It's quite important because that language helps make the humanities look like a hobby, you know, a private, 
passion, an optional extra that some people are really keen on. It makes them look non-essential. And I thought, somehow, these university websites are already buying in to that idea that, that classics is our, is our hobby, not what the bloody country needs, right? So, uh, I, I confess that it is easier to satirise these um, PR exercises than to do better, but I'm going to have a bit of a go. I have chickened out of giving you my own fantasy classics website, Y Classics, though I am tempted to offer an unofficial prize for anyone who can really write a good one. What I'm going to do instead is look at three big questions that for me are crucial when we come to explain what we are doing this for. I think there's, a, it's within education, as I said, by and large, but I think that all the questions that I raise have got wider uh, implications outside. Now, if there was somebody else up here, they'd have other things they'd want to focus on. That's for sure. You know, it's, this is not an attempt to kind of impose an orthodoxy. What you're getting is what I think. Right? You don't have to believe it. OK, my first question is, what or how do we learn from the classical past that is useful for understanding the present? Now, that question is often treated by professional classicists as a bit of an elephant in the room. Most of us get anxious about the notion that there are direct lessons in the ancient world that we can learn from. But I think I'm beginning to feel increasingly that we should be a bit careful before throwing the baby out with the bathwater here. I was struck earlier this year when I heard the Spanish novelist Antonio Munoz Molina give his reply to a similar question. What can you learn from the past, um, classical and otherwise? He said, yes, it could be hard to learn from the past. There were dangers in thinking that you could. But he said, we didn't actually have anywhere else we could learn from. So we ought to try and work out how we were going to learn from the past intelligently. I think what tends to worry us are the slick, off-the-shelf parallels that people often want to draw from the classical world. How like Pericles is Boris Johnson? Well, <laughs> uh, not very is the answer. We can all give that. Not very at all. What Roman emperor is Donald Trump most like? Now, when journalists used to ask me that, as they did probably about once a week, uh, I always used to say, Elagabalus. Because he was an emperor, I was pretty certain that the journalist in question would not have heard of. So at least they would have had to have Googled him and done a bit of work before they could do their article. But the question I actually posed a few minutes ago was a bit different from that. It was not what cheap parallels are there in the ancient world for some of our modern preoccupations. It was what do we learn from the classical past that is useful for understanding the present? And as I said, in answer to that, I've become a bit more bullish than I used to be. That's partly, I think, as I tried to show in my little book uh, on women and power, deep history going back to the ancient world can help us contextualize, I'm not saying explain, I'm saying contextualize all kinds of modern assumptions and prejudices. That's partly because we're still debating some of the big questions that were debated in the ancient world and on whose terms of argument we still depend. But it goes beyond that. It's not that you know, we, like Plato, were wondering about the self. That's, that's true, but it goes further. The study of ancient Greece and of Rome, I think, is very good at teaching us and our students the complexity of how our view of the past is constructed 
and why we have come to take for granted the ideas that we do, for better or worse, take for granted. Also helps you avoid the besetting sin of presentism, the easy assumption or the blindness that helps you argue or imagine that the big problems we face now have no history. They do have a history, and we can learn from the history, even if the history doesn't offer us a packaged solution. One example of that, I think, could be found in the pandemic. Now, it goes without saying, please, please don't misreport me and say, you know, we didn't really need a vaccine. That's not what I'm saying. It goes without saying that our physical survival depended on scientific responses that were devised within university science departments and elsewhere from the vaccine on one hand to new treatments of the disease on another. You know, and that's why, let's be honest, that it's thanks to the discipline of science that some of us, many of us perhaps, are quite literally still alive. So, as I say, I'm not saying that we should have sacked the vaccinologists and replaced them with classicists. That would not have been a good idea. What I am saying is that survival in the biggest sense, for a community, a society to survive that kind of disaster, Survival isn't just about physical survival. It's about learning how to face what you have been through or what you are going through. It's about cognitively processing it. It's about trying to understand what, in the broadest sense, the very nature of a pandemic is. And that's where classics, and I think the humanities more general, come in they're as, as, as essential as science to that kind of survival. I, I found myself repeatedly saying to people during COVID, um, what's the originary moment of Western literature? Uh, mostly, if you ask that question, you get a rather blank look, right? So what I'd say, because you all know what the answer is, I'd say, it's the pandemic at the start of the Iliad, right? Western literature was born of plague. Whoops, there's a picture, a medieval picture of Apollo doing the nasties at the beginning of the Iliad, just as a bit of decoration. What I think we have to get across is that there has never been a time when literature hadn't been sparking off from getting its head around and helping us get our heads around what plague is. You can do that in Thucydides, you can do that in Sophocles' OT, but it always seemed to me terribly important, and people were a bit aghast when I said, that's where literature in the West starts, so we need to think about it. It will help us think about it. And I think that's one of the things that Munoz Molina meant when he said the past is all we've got. In terms of that kind of social and intellectual resource, the past is all we've got. So that would, be, that would be one thing on my web website. My second question is how do we relate ourselves and our own diverse identities to the study of the Greeks and the Romans? You know, what is the connection between the Greeks and the Romans and us? Now, as I'm sure many of you know, that's currently a hot topic, for it is commonly and increasingly argued that one problem of the ancient classical world is that it looks, or better, has been made to look, so European that it can seem to be the property of scholars and students of a white European background. So the argument goes on, if, as we surely do, we want to attract a wider and more diverse range of students into the subject, in particular people of colour, we need to extend the disciplinary and geographic boundaries of the subject beyond the so-called heartlands of Greece and Italy into Western Asia, Africa and beyond. If Egypt, for instance, was more central within the discipline, we would encourage more students 
who don't identify themselves as white European, to see themselves in classics and to find themselves in classics. Now, of course, I understand that logic, and I realize it is terrible hubris for an insider like me to offer their own solutions to why an outsider might feel put off. Even so, I'd like to turn those arguments completely on their heads. Uh, just to be clear, I'm not for a moment saying that the disciplinary, chronological, or geographical boundaries of classics should stay where they are. Disciplinary boundaries are always, to some extent, arbitrary, and since their invention, which was only in the 19th century, honestly, they've always been shifting. There's no right answer to where disciplinary boundaries should lie, but a series of pluses and minuses as you move them about. It makes a difference what book is next to what other book in your library or who your department has coffee with or next to. That makes a difference to what you do. And I've seen all kinds of shifts in my own lifetime. I'm pleased, for example, and it's really added to my understanding of ancient Greece, that now the Persian Empire, for example, takes a much bigger part in Greek history than the kind of cardboard cutout enemy it was when I was an undergraduate student. It was only brought out when there was something called a Persian War, and then the Persians were kind of put back again, and they came out with the next Persian War. There are, however, I think, dangers, serious dangers, with the finding yourself argument in classics. Particularly when it's, I think, driving changes in the subject. Let me put it this way. One of the problems about classics, certainly in this country over the last couple of hundred years, is that some people, largely powerful or would-be powerful white men, have thought that they could see themselves in the ancient world and that the Greeks and Romans were like them and they've sometimes weaponized that perceived similarity and that's been the problem. Let's have a look at one fairly innocent example of that. Um, this is Prince Albert um, seen in a statue that he himself commissioned of himself as a Greek warrior, as a present for his new bride, Victoria. Now, I have to say, he looks frightfully silly, and Victoria thought that too. Um, and the first version of the statue, which is on the left, ended up in a back corridor in Osborne House on the Isle of Wight. Um, and uh, he got a, a second version, which is still in Buckingham Palace, where you see that he doesn't show so much thigh, right? <laughs> He's, uh, it slightly lengthened the skirt, right? <laughs> now, I, I, because it's a Hellenic, uh, it's a Hellenic event. I didn't show you, you know, almost every toff throughout European history dressed as a Roman, but you can imagine those. But we've got Albert dressed as a sort of hoplite, I think, here. Um, more dangerous, though. I mean, that's a, I think, you know, quite innocent example. More dangerous is this kind of thing where you see uh, the far right uh, and white supremacists, particularly in the United States, but not only in the United States, um, using an identity with um, the ancient world to justify this kind of white supremacist propaganda. I shall take them off the screen. Oh, you'll have to look at Peter now. <laughs> it's much nicer to look at Mr. Frank about Professor Frankopan than to look at a load of white supremacists. So enjoy him. You know, let's have him for a bit longer. My point is, if we want to confront that kind of appropriation, and particularly the nasty sort of appropriation, we don't do that by pretending, and it is a pretense, that other people can find themselves in the classical world too. Or instead, we have the challenge the half-truth, and it's no more than that, that any of us can truly see ourselves in the ancient Greeks, or for that matter, the Roman Britons. The ancients are different from us. 
There may be all kinds of connections and all kinds of conversations we can have with antiquity, whose writers were obviously debating themes that are still important to us, from slavery and sex to empire and exploitation. But I think we ought, here's back to the website, we ought to be positively celebrating the fact that antiquity is not a place where anyone now alive actually belongs. You know, it's the old cliche, the past is a foreign country. And it's because it's a foreign country that it is so extraordinarily valuable. Ancient Greece or Roman Britain, if you like, I think it's a bit harder to argue for Roman Britain in this case, but you probably could. Ancient Greece offers a safe space a positive, shared, intellectual space for discussing some of the most difficult issues I've just mentioned, sex, empire, exploitation, and slavery. Now, I had a great practical experience of that last year, talking in a school to some early teens about free speech. What was amazing was that the vast majority of these bright kids imagined that free speech was a very recent problem, right? That it was to do with social media, cancel culture, Toby Young and JK Rowling. They hadn't actually heard of Socrates. Most of them had not heard of Socrates. When we introduced him to them, it was a complete eye-opener. That was partly because it gave them the kind of long historical context, the antidote to presentism that I just mentioned, and it gave them in the process a wholly different level of argumentative nuance. But it also gave them a safe space in which to argue, one in which they weren't already invested or pinned to a particular position, or and they weren't anxious about saying something that they thought might offend their friends. You can say anything about Socrates. It's fine. He's long dead, right? <laughs> That's his virtue, right? <laughs> it's sort of way I'd say everybody was freed up. The discussion about free speech instantly got better, got more productive and more interesting. To put it snappily, the classical world was quite literally there, intellectually liberating for these kids. And I think that happens, I think that happens in the classroom. I mean, you know, when in discussions about uh, race, exploitation, empire, you know, you can have really good discussions if you carve them out of the ancient world. And I'm not saying that we should stay in the ancient world and never discuss modern race, but I am saying that it's a place where you can actually learn how to argue. And that leads on to my third question, final question, which is simply, what do we think the study of classics teaches us or our students uh, to do? What does it teach us to do? I'm not saying here so much what does it teach us about, it's what does it teach us to do. Now, years ago, Pat Easterling, who I know that many of you here will know, answered that question in a way that opened my eyes at the time when she said, simple, it teaches us to read difficult things. Right? And I suppose, I'm not sure I saw what she meant back then, but now I really do see what she meant. And I think that my answer is in the same sort of zone as that, although not entirely identical. Pat is a very wise person. My answer, I suppose, slightly different from hers, would be, like many other humanities disciplines, but classics is, classics is always extreme humanities, isn't it? You know, there's, it's, more, it's more of a humanities discipline than any other discipline could possibly be. Right? Classics teaches us, first of all, to argue responsibly on the basis of inadequate evidence. And it teaches us to discuss productively questions to which there are no right answers, or answers at all in the common sense of the term answer. The quality of Sophocles' poetry, the rise of the city-state, or whatever. 
And we should brag about that much more than we do. For both those skills, how to argue when you don't know everything and you haven't got enough information, and how to disagree around a question where there is no right answer, both those skills are absolutely essential and fundamental to the democratic process and to the health of public debate. Now, of course, there are some questions uh, that do have right and wrong answers, um, and those are largely more boring, I think. Um, but the majority, the majority of the questions that uh, exercise us, that seem most important and seem most divisive, questions about justice, about morality, dare I say it, about Brexit, are among those questions that don't have right answers and which we don't have an adequate evidence to make a final decision. The important point is, though, I think, that in order to have those conversations and those arguments about that kind of question, you have to learn how to talk and argue about them. And you have to learn that even when there are no right answers, some answers and some arguments are actually better than others. And I think that's what we teach our students all the time. And if you don't teach people that, you end up in the complete madness of the Twitter sphere. <laughs> Living there the whole time, you know, awful, right. So, I mean, I, I realize I'm going to sound a bit preachy when I say this, but what I'm saying is that the humanities and classics at their vanguard, at the most extreme, they are absolutely an essential foundation of the democratic process and they are as essential to the civic good as STEM subjects are. In a way, I suppose I'm picking up the point I made earlier about not loving the subject. We have to get across to people that classics isn't a nice excuse for sitting around and indulging in, in an interesting chat about a few fragments of Sappho. Right? Now, we might do that, and I've had great fun over my lifetime in chat about a few fragments of Sappho, but it's part and parcel of a much, much bigger project, intellectual project, which ultimately underpins civic debate. So that's what I would say to that silly woman in the Times if I were to meet her, and also what I'd like to see us recognising just more kind of bravely than we do. But to finish, I hope you don't mind if I just turn in the last second or two to the Runciman Award itself. I said at the start that the health of classics and of Hellenic studies more generally doesn't actually depend solely on the institutions of formal education. It depends on people still wanting to read about Hellenic culture and having something good to read about Hellenic culture and having sponsors who are willing to reward what is good to read on Hellenic culture. Now, I don't know, no one's told me who's won. I'm, so I shall be on the edge of my seat just like all the rest of you. Um, but I have read the shortlist and I can tell you they're bloody brilliant, right? And they, every single book is a fantastic ambassador for Greek culture, ancient and modern. So I think we can thank all the shortlisted writers who are here, because they've done a fantastic job. Thank you. <laughs> That was amazing. Thank you so much, Mary. I, I went on from classics to a career in public policy, di diplomacy, and um, what you said really resonated. I took in my finals a course on fourth century Greek history, and the constant question was, what do we know? What can we know? What can we assert? What can we deduce? What is it reasonable to say, and how good our, our arguments, bearing in mind that we don't really have much history, we have sources. And this was 
at the time a fantastic lesson in itself, but in the sphere of public policy, you almost always, despite what everybody thinks about governments knowing everything or nothing, you're almost always in an intermediate place where you know something has to be done and you want to do the best thing, but you're doing so through inadequate evidence. You're looking at a range of data, a range of narrative, a range of evidence that doesn't quite tell you what to do and you have to be able to assess it and weigh it and try to find the best way forward. Governments, policymakers don't always get it right, but it's the integrity of that process that I think really matters. And that's one of the things, as Mary has said, uh, a classics course can teach you, because you will be looking at the nature of what you know, or think you know, or can know. Mary, thank you also for forwarding us on to Peter, which, who, of course, we've all enjoyed uh, looking at for the last uh, <laughs> for the last 10 minutes. Um, I should say I have a, a small gift behind which I will pass to you uh, at, at the end. A, a, a gift that's wholly, uh, wholly inconsequential in terms of the great wisdom that you've shared with us. Thank you. Fantastic talk. Right, the award itself. Um, so, my thanks first. Um, I want to thank all of the judges. This year's judging panel has been um, uh, some of the experienced hands uh, and two new hands. So uh, the new hands, Oliver Thomas, who's with us in the audience uh, tonight, Vasiliki Kolokotroni, who I know is watching online. Thank you for joining the judging panel. Uh, thank you to Judith Mossman and Sofka Zinoviev, who also are watching online. Thank you very much for, for coming back. Uh, uh, both of you um, after a number of years of doing this for us, uh, and of course uh, their chair, uh, Peter Frankopan. Our judges are unremunerated. Um, they do it because of, well, I'm a bit worried about using this word, they, they do it because of the love, <laughs> the love of classics or Byzantine uh, history or modern uh, literature and history. Um, I have the great pleasure. I'm also the administrator of the award. Uh, every year I think I say this, if anybody would like to take that fantastic responsibility over from me, do talk to me at the end. Um, it is an enormous responsibility, but it is fantastic. One of the things you get to do is to listen to the judges, um, to listen and not to interfere uh, in their discussions. And I was struck this year, as last year and the previous year, um, by formidable expertise that they bring to bear on the books, but also by you know, the, skill, the soft skills, the skills of listening and persuading and the skills of bargaining as they try to reach a consensus on the best clutch of books for the shortlist and then the best book uh, of the year, the winner. For the past three years, the panel has been chaired by Peter Frankopan. Peter will step down tonight after tonight's, to, after tonight's ceremony. And before I invite him to the stage to reveal all, I want to say just a few words of thanks. As Mary is in the field of classics, so Peter is in the world of Byzantine and global history, a rock star academic, professor of global history at Oxford, where he's the Stavros Niarchos Foundation Director of the Center for Byzantine Research. He has a finger in most corners of the global pie, the Mediterranean, Russia, the Middle East, Iran, Central Asia, China. With such global issue, uh, interests, he's in truly global demand. If you're the administrator of a prize that Peter is chairing, tracking him down is one of the most daunting experiences, but also one of the most interesting, because he could be almost anywhere. Thank goodness for Wi-Fi on planes, because quite a lot of our conversations seem to take place on uh, dodgy Wi-Fi lines, uh, 35,000 feet uh, or however high um, above the planet. While presiding brilliantly and with his customary attention to this year's uh, competition, Peter has brought to fruition his latest book project, The Earth Transformed, looking at environmental history and climate the ways they've shaped the human and natural past. The book has made a huge impact already. It's been visible in every bookstore I've been in. It's been commented on, reviewed extensively. Um, it's making a real impact.
congratulations to you, Peter, for that. Now, many of us here in this room and online, a fair number of academics, some professionals, civil servants, diplomats, many others, will have seen many different chairs and styles of chairing in action. We'll all have seen good chairs, dismal chairs, combative chairs, in attentive chairs, passive aggressive chairs. Chairs who pursue their own line to the exclusion of all others. Peter is a tremendous chair. Proofs really simple. In each of the three years that he's chaired the Runciman jury, he's succeeded in teasing out a consensus, not putting things to a vote, finding a consensus, however far apart the judges may have been at the start of the process. It hasn't always been easy, of course, to achieve a consensus. That's the point of a book prize. We compare apples with oranges, with pears and with mangoes. It's an extremely difficult challenge. It's designed to be a difficult, difficult challenge. And it requires real skill to chair a group of people through that. Peter's commitment to proceeding towards a consensus is not only admirable in itself, a skill that's not shown enough in our society, it's resulted in winning books that are recognizably winners that are supported by all. Peter, I've really enjoyed working with you and all of us at the League owe you a huge debt of thanks. I'm going to invite you to the stage in a minute. I've got something in my pocket for you. There's something down here. These are small tokens of esteem. Um, and they're small because what we owe you is, of course, much, much bigger. Thank you from my heart on behalf of all of the League and all of the readers of books for all you've done for the last three years and before that as a member of the, the jury. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Your Royal Highness, Excellencies, distinguished guests, uh, and many friends in the room and online. Well, I'm, I'm slightly embarrassed by that, but, um, but thank you, John, for the very kind words. It's, it's been a real honour and a privilege, and also, importantly, a pleasure to have been involved in the Runciman Prize as chair for three years, but also as a judge uh, before then. I think there's a bottle in there. I'm quite tempted to crack it open <laughs> and, and start drinking it. Um, John, I'm very grateful to you uh, for your kind words tonight, but also for your energy and resourcefulness in fundraising, everything that you've said like a good diplomat is not only skillful and elegant, but also you've stolen the best lines. Um, when you were talking about the importance of the humanities uh, before Mary, but it's already quite a tough act to follow, um, I turned to Louisa and said that I think my speech had been nicked. But anyway, for all, all that you've done to make our lives easy, I'm extremely um, grateful. Um, and as um, Mary, or Professor Dame Mary Bid, to return the compliment, um, Everything that, that um, Professor Beard said about the humanities, I, I couldn't say better myself. Um, not just about the humanities generally, but also, of course, about Greece, Greeks, Byzantines, and Byzantine cultures, Hellenic cultures generally, but also in the importance of not just following our loves and our passions, but on their importance, the humanities. Who would have thought that it mattered what it meant to be Ukrainian rather than Russian? And how do you learn that? Uh, who codified the Quran, when and why? Why does that matter? Well, perhaps we should know something about that. And in my own field, looking at the world of Byzantine studies and the peoples of Central Eastern Europe, of whom I include Greece, uh, the last 500 years have passed in total silence. Uh, and that has importance, I think, for our ideas around European presence and futures, as well as about their pasts. Prizes like this, as both um, Mary and John have said, remind us of the importance of studying, of learning, of thinking. And what makes the books that we have shortlisted so important is it is the passion, actually, about how all these seven books reinterpret, retell, reinvestigate, often themes and subjects that are well known um, and in completely transformational ways. It's been a pleasure and a joy to read not just these, but also many of the other books on the long list. I'll say something about those too, uh, but I'm keen to get on to our winner um, to let them 
talk. That's, you see, gender neutral. No one will know. Um, it's also important, this award, because it encourages all authors writing about um, any subject to do with Greece, past, present, and future. It encourages publishers, and it's a great pleasure that so many of the seven books on the shortlist have small independent publishers to their visibility in encouraging uh, publishers to pick up texts is important. One of the things that uh, John and I have done in the last few years is to twist arms of some of the big publishers to make sure that books that are shortlisted will be committed into paperback and therefore more affordable, more available and pushing humanities too. So I'm very grateful and honoured to have played a very small part in this machine for a long time um, and very grateful to the sponsors, uh, the supporters, uh, to John and as John has already said, the generosity of everybody involved, everybody at the League, our hosts here at King's and the support that our colleagues give to all of our subjects to do with anything Greek and Hellenic, uh, to my judges, my fellow judges, uh, to Judith Mossman, to Sofka Zinoviev, to Oliver Thomas, and Vasiliki Kolkotroni. It's been a, a real pleasure to get to know them over the years and to have the terrible job of having to pick between books. And of course, in the presence of uh, Mary tonight, what a stellar lineup with so many shortlisted authors here too. It's, it's a real pleasure. Uh, we started with uh, quite a long, long list that we, um, that, that between them talk about the real strength of well, the humanities, across all sorts of ranges, all sorts of genres. Um, the kinds of writing that's going on about things to do with Greece are extraordinary. We've had things like Sarah Derby, Untangling Blackness in Greek Antiquity, absolutely spellbinding. Peter Toneman, a fantastic scholar writing about rural society in Roman Anatolia. Uh, Lucy Parker from my own parish in Oxford on Simi and the Stylite. Paul Stevenson on New Rome. Uh, Matt Stanley, a History of Nafplio. These are all of them extraordinary books. All could be, not just on the shortlist, all could have been winners under a different set of parameters. Um, we, try, we try to think, as I try to think as a chair, we as a committee, of thinking about curating a shortlist that represents all areas of Greece. It's perhaps not surprising that classical antiquity is always very strongly represented because of the legacies in history, but this collection, as you'll see behind, I think is a very rich and exciting one uh, as a group as well as individually. Uh, picking all of those is difficult. Um, picking one of those, rather, I should say, is difficult. Uh, but each of these seven books really are passionate in the way in which they engage with their materials. We have two collections of poems, Antony Alexaguru, Heritage Aesthetics, Antony's brand new voice. It's an astonishing debut that focuses on identities, on ideas about diasporas, uh, about colonization. It's incredibly powerful, and I expect many great things of Antony in the future. A. E. Stallings, a very well-known poet, will be welcoming up to Oxford as our new Oxford Professor of Poetry next year. Uh, this Afterlife, Selected Poems. It's a glorious collection with so many different themes to do with women, to do with myth, to do with uh, translations of people like Seferis, the rhyme and the verse. It's a fantastically powerful collection. Um, Juliet Harvey, Fear of Light, based on a true story, uh, captures the claustrophobia, the ideas of identities, the ideas of um, old scars being reopened, some painful truths about Greece's, hist Greece's history in the 20th century. Uh, Laura Beatty, looking, looking for Theophrastus, travels in search of a lost philosopher. Incredibly ingenious, exciting way of trying to engage with Theophrastus through conversations, through following uh, a whole pathway through the Eastern Aegean, a uh, work of great ingenuity. Again, these things can't get done by chat GPT three or four, I suspect five. Uh, Richard Buxton, Greek myths that shape the way we think. I think it's extraordinary how powerful those Greek legacies are 2,000 years on, the way in which the eight cha different chapters following a different hero, we might all think we know about Oedipus and his legacy on Freud, but things like the way in which Prometheus has played a role on filmmaking of Ridley Scott and others, the way in which those Greek stories are somehow still central around us. And there are lots of reasons why that's the case, but it's more surprising uh, than, than we might think, and the Buxton book tells us that too. Uh, we've had Rivial Neitz telling us a new history of Greek mathematics, where, again, we walk through some of those figures whose names we know, but having maths explained to uh, some of us who are concentrating maybe too much in the humanities is still very helpful, sometimes a bit difficult to follow, the ideas about optics and applied and pure mathematics, but incredibly important that Greece is not just about history, but about the scientific side too. And then Carrie Vout exposed 
uh, the Greek and Roman body, an extraordinary book, uh, worthy winner of the London Hellenic Prize just now. Um, it's breathtakingly original. Uh, we move away from images of Prince Albert or Apollo Belvedere to look at the body in all sorts of different ways that we, like all fantastic and original and brilliant books, makes you wonder why we haven't been doing this before. The coerced body, the disabled body, the ways in which ideas about what, where bodies come from and how these kinds of questions, as Professor Beard mentioned, how they preoccupied people living not hundreds but thousands of years ago. Now, as a committee, uh, we could have come to blows. Um, we didn't and we didn't come close. One of the things we always have talked about in the Runciman Prize is the legacy of Sir Stephen Runciman, after whom this award is named, both in terms of trying to shed new light onto, new, onto old or new topics, but also in writing in ways that can engage with the general public. It was interesting that John said, uh, encouraging stopping people on the tube, I, I leave people on their own on the tube, but on aeroplanes or on beaches, by swimming pools, people sitting in their garden, sitting in the park, it's finding a book that will connect with different kinds of readers and encourage people to pick up one of these books, then maybe the other six too, and to proselytize, evangelize, and tell others why they should be enlightened. The most important thing this year was a book that made all five of us, our souls, sing with joy. And it gives me huge pleasure, therefore, to introduce the winner of this year's Runciman Award, A.E. Stallings, for this afterlife, Selected Poems. Thank you, Peter. Congratulations, Alicia. The microphone is yours. This has uh, been a week where I feel I'm in an alternate universe. Um, thank you, um, everyone. Uh, all of you rock stars of extreme humanities, uh, which is a phrase that I love. Um, I, I think I, superstitiously, I know that I won this prize because I was absolutely convinced that I was not going to win. Um, not because I have doubts in the judging or anything like that. I have been uh, shortlisted or longlisted before um, for translations, and I think it just seemed an act of hubris um, to put my own poems there in the mix, but also a very selfish act because one of the reasons I love to have um, books uh, put forth for this prize is I know for a certainty that it will be read by the ideal readers who are the judges of this prize, and they are my perfect readers. So um, it's partly an act of selfishness that I, I ask um, a book to be put forth. And I was thinking, actually, some years ago, I was supposed to come to this event. I had been shortlisted for a translation of Hesiod, and I wasn't able to come in the end because of a family emergency. But I was thinking about Hesiod and his works and days because um, here is the first poet personality at the beginning of Western literature, the first poet whom we have a name for and an autobiography of. Um, and one of the main points of his autobiography is that he won a prize. Um, not the Runciman Award, but the, um, uh, the amphit amphitomous uh, memorial tripod and um, that that was really important to him. And I thought about 
how we think about prizes as writers and pr maybe particularly as poets. It's sort of traditional to come up here and say that one is very humbled when that is actually not what happens. <laughs> one, is, one is feeling, you know, one's head grow larger. Um, uh, but it is humbling in a sense. Um, uh, but the, why is it important? On Twitter, um, you will see poets say prizes are not important. We all say prizes are not important, and the work itself is what is important. So I was thinking back to why it was so important to Hesiod. And um, there are a couple of points where he talks about poets. One of them is quite early on in the works and days where he talks about um, envy. You know, potter hates potter, builder has no regard for builder, nor beggar, beggar. Bard hates Bard, or Bard envies Bard. But then he kind of goes right into this gospel of the good strife, which is competition. And again, I think we think in the arts, maybe, um, maybe we're just supposed to love what we're doing. <laughs> maybe it's just a hobby. But this idea of confronting it as a competition, not necessarily with each other, um, but with oneself and with the art that has gone in the past and the art that is um, coming. It's one of the reasons why you write. You get up and you think, could I do better than that? Or you read a poem, you think I could do better than that. Um, there are various reasons, but I think um, I'm quite charmed by the idea uh, that the good strife um, is governed not just by the goddess Nike of victory, but more by the nine goddesses, the muses, who are there to stimulate us to try to do better, to try to at least do as well as we can, but then also a little better. And I love the idea that these goddesses, almost all Greek goddesses, and there are many people here who can, you know, correct me later, um, you know, have some sort of uh, counter goddess or some sort of figure in Middle Eastern mythology or in Indo-European mythology, but the muses are sort of stubbornly very Hellenic and I think appropriate to the prize. Um, there was a, recently a picture of an ancient Greek pot on Twitter and I wish I had written down all the information about it, but I was really charmed by the images, which is of a potter's workshop, and you have all these potters doing their wonderful um, pots with a woman potter looking on. And um, then there are all these Nike goddesses crowning them, and this idea that they're competing, that this is an agon, that this is a competition the way athletics is a competition. And the goal, again, is not victory but excellence, but it's that idea of competition and prizes, which is very Greek. And I think it's something that we tend to kind of poo-poo sometimes and then, you know, it's, it is an extremely important affirmation and confirmation. You're not guaranteed that the world will notice what you're doing and maybe you spend a lifetime doing something without anyone noticing. Um, but it's just a tremendous encouragement and um, it's a moving affirmation when people whose work you admire so much um, give you this, this honor. Um, I, I think also for a book of selected poems, it seemed perhaps like it would be a far-fetched choice, just because a selected poems, it's not a book of poems about Greek mythology or a cycle of poems from the point of view of Penelope. Um, it is not a translation, all of it, from a modern Greek poem. Um, it is just points from my life where I'm writing poems, and it turns out, though, when I went to select these poems, that an enormous number of them are either about Greece, modern Greece, ancient Greece, Greek mythology, Greek history, or Greek. Some of that is because I have lived in Greece for 20 years. I did go through a period of studying ancient Greek and then you know, continue to study modern Greek. Um, and I do think about mythology all the time. But it was interesting looking at the book as a whole and thinking, about this as a book that is, even I think when it doesn't look like it is interacting with things Greek, um, Greekness will peak forth. You know, there might be a, book, a poem about an ultrasound, but there will be an allegory from Plato's cave. Um, there will be a poem about balloons that will have the sack of the winds. There will be a poem about a cast iron skillet, and it will have a reference to the Iliad. 
But I think ultimately poems have to speak for themselves. That is the nature of poems. And um, so with gratitude, I'll read um, five or six poems for you. And I think we'll see a little bit about how Greece and Greek and Greek mythology kind of change and flow through the work that is still ongoing. The first poem in this book is the first poem from my first book, and the po book's title is taken from it. It is a sonnet called Postcard from Greece and purports to be about a car accident. My husband disagrees with many of the facts about this car accident, to which I say he may write his own sonnet. <laughs> a postcard from Greece. Hatched from sleep as we slipped out of orbit round a clothespin curve new watered with the rain, I saw the sea, the sky, as bright as pain, that outer space through which we were to plummet. No guardrails hemmed the road, no way to stop it. The only warning here and there, a shrine, some tended still, some antique and forgotten, empty of oil, but all were consecrated to those who lost their wild race with the road and sliced the tedious sea once like a knife. Somehow, we struck an olive tree instead. Our car stopped on the cliff's brow. Suddenly safe, we clung together, shade to pagan shade, surprised by sunlight, air, this afterlife. So that was on a visit to Greece. I didn't yet live there. And um, I think my writing about Greek mythology is different before when I lived in, say, Atlanta, Georgia, than it is now living in Athens, Greece. This is an early one, the wife of the man of many wiles. Believe what you want to. Believe that I wove, if you wish, 20 years and waited while you were knee deep in blood, hip deep in goddesses. I've not much to show for 20 years weaving. I have but one half finished cloth at the loom, perhaps, it's the lengthy, meticulous grieving. Explain how you want to. Believe I unraveled at night what I stitched in the slow siesta, how I kept them all waiting for me to finish. The suitors, you call them. Believe what you want to. Believe that they waited for me to finish. Believe I beguiled them with nightly undoings. Believe what you want to that they never touched me. Believe your own stories as you would have me do how you only survived by the wise infidelities. Believe that each day you wrote me a letter that never arrived. Kill all the damn suitors if you think it will make you feel better. Some, some of the poems with, that are based in Greece, you can tell how long I've been in there because I, I actually put how long I've been there. This is a, a sonnet again for those keeping track um, called Buzuki. After five years here, I understand most of the sung words, recognize the tune, but there's an element I'll never get that isn't born in me. The way they play, one manages to hold his cigarette between, between two fingers on his strumming hand, takes drags between his solos, and then soon how something changes. A woman starts to sway around an absent center, ancient wrongs cherished. The cigarette gives up its ghost. The music drives now. Someone makes a toast as suddenly the melody arrives at minor, Asia minor, in whose songs the hands of lovers always rhyme with knives. For those of you doing the Greek, you'll see that that is true. Um, so I think things sort of change as we go through the book. Um, this is a couple of books later. Um, and this is the start of another book of poems of mine, and it's called After a Greek Proverb, and I threw my publisher into fits because there's a Greek quotation from the get-go, and so, you know, there's different characters and things to, to check, and I don't think I need to translate it because it'll become clear in the poem, um, for those of you not following in the Greek. 
Those following on the formal side, this is a villanelle. And you'll see this as I've been living in Greece for a while, and this is during the economic crisis, and I'm trying to get more tear gas into my poems. After a Greek proverb. Uthen monimoteron tu prosorinu. We're here for the time being, I answer to the query. Just for a couple of years, we said a dozen years back. Nothing is more permanent than the temporary. We dine sitting on folding chairs. They were cheap but cheery. We've taped the broken window pane, TV still out of whack. We're here for the time being, I answer to the query. When we crossed the water, we only brought what we could carry, but there are always boxes that you never do unpack. Nothing is more permanent than the temporary. Sometimes when I'm feeling weepy, you propose a theory, nostalgia and tear gas have the same acrid smack. We're here for the time being, I answer to the query. We stash bones in the closet when we don't have time to bury. Stuff receipts in envelopes, file papers in a stack. Nothing is more permanent than the temporary. Twelve years now, and we're still eating off the ordinary. We left our wedding china behind, afraid that it might crack. We're here for the time being, we answer to the query, but nothing is more permanent than the temporary. Um, the years of economic crisis and austerity, crisis was always the wrong term, um, since a crisis is a, a moment um, where things can go either way. Um, I think a decade is not a crisis. And um, on top of that, uh, right towards that coming to a resolution, um, we had the Syrian civil war and that began a much larger migration, which is also still ongoing and I think a crisis is not the right term for it. Um, I became somewhat involved with volunteering and so forth and my children are, were smaller obviously um, in say 2016 than they are now, um, but just, you know, Again, we had just this terrible news of the shipwreck off of Pylos in international waters where um, hundreds and hundreds of people have gone down to the bottom of the sea. Um, most of the people in the hold will be women and children. It's also the deepest part of the Mediterranean. I don't know why, but I find that an, an additional chilling element. Um, but how do you write about this when this is happening on your doorstep? I did not want to, you know, take someone else's experience or try to write from someone else's point of view when this is something that is happening rather than safely maybe in the past or a classical space. Um, so I tried to explore what empathy means. Empathy. My love, I'm grateful tonight. Our listing bed isn't a raft, precariously adrift as we dodge the Coast Guard light and class hold of a girl and a boy. I'm glad we didn't wake our kids in the thin hours to take not a thing, not a favorite toy, and didn't hand over our cash to one of the smuggling rackets. That we didn't buy cheap life jackets no better than bright orange trash and less buoyant. I'm glad that the dark above us is not deeply twinned beneath us and moiled with wind and we don't scan the sky for a mark, any mark that demarcates a shore as the dinghy starts taking on water. I'm glad that our six-year-old daughter who can't swim is a foot off the floor in the bottom bunk, and our son with his broken arms high and dry, that the ceiling is not seeping sky with our journey, but hardly begun. Empathy isn't generous, it's selfish. It's not being nice to say I would pay any price not to be those who die to be us. And I thought I'd, I'd close on a, a, a last sonnet. They're not all sonnets in here, don't be afraid. Um, but this, I think it goes back to studying Greek as a much younger person and studying ancient Greek and 
now living in what I feel is the continuum that is Greek and being in the landscape that is Greece and trying to put all of that together. Um, and I think this is an audience that will um, appreciate this poem. Learning to read Greek. As though a host of diacritical marks swooped over the rough breathing of the sea, the swallows parse the brightness in dark arcs, glossing the infinitive to be. Hexameters drum surging to the shore, spondaic at the end with their long vowels. The sea gleams like a shield washed clean of gore, and as light's noun declines, the little owls pipe from the needled forest, each to each in dialect, about times take and give, the aorist now forever out of reach, and how the moon is chased and has been wronged, and speak of sorrow in the genitive as if it were to her the world belonged. A good evening from me as well, His Royal Highness, all of you who are present, members of the council, members of the jury. It is really a pleasure to be united for an evening of thinking and reflecting on poetry. What an inspirational evening it has been. I'm really deeply grateful to Professor Mary Beard, who will forever leave me with a quote that classics is humanities, not in extremis, but in the extreme. And I like that, the thought of drawing intellectually liberating material out of the classics and of reminding us of our tasks as teachers before we go back to writing our books. And then to know that these books are appreciated. All those hours spent in isolation that they don't find not just a few readers, but an audience of readers, and a jury of readers that looks at them with such um, a keen insight, looking for what is readable, inspirational, and can be transmitted. I'm deeply grateful for that kind of recognition. It's important for everyone who reads and writes and spends those hours in isolation to know that there are believers in good books. Thank you very much, Peter, for presenting the hard work of the jury. And of course, thank you always to our generous sponsors who give us so much freedom in doing what we do, interesting that we'll make the best of it, and, and also being present when we get to show these wonderful results. Thank you very much. I'm, for a lifetime now, a huge admirer of Alicia Stallings. We actually occasionally circulate in the same neighborhoods in Athens. We have common friends. And, uh, uh, and I've always been struck by the way she combines intellect with compassion. You heard that in a few, one, in a few of her poems, but having seen her at work in Greece, that compassion is also very much a compassion of the practice, not a compassion in isolation behind our desk. Absolutely not. Alicia is in the forefront of working with refugees. Alicia is almost a clearinghouse of those who want to contribute to volunteers, uh, uh, contribute as volunteers, contribute with financial resources, or with their time and effort on behalf of that great challenge of Greece, that is refugeehood. And we are reminded every single day just how uh, painful, occasionally important that challenge is. Alicia is, for me, the Hesiod who is deserving of his prize, but much more appreciative of women. I mean, Hesiod and women didn't quite match. She comes to the topic of poetry, to the craft, to the artisanship 
of poetry, and I say that deliberately because she has her classical training in mind when it comes to the form of poetry, she comes to it with a dexterity that is unique, with a conscience that, is, that goes very deep, with an ability to bring the intellectual together with the almost mundane, and yet to then subvert that mundane and bring the intellectual back out again. I love the poem about the broken washing machine and how it starts the breakdown of the washing machine, how it may well point up a few cracks in marital life. She combines the domestic with the global, the challenge with stability, refugeehood with the kind of quiet that may well be the temporary, but the temporary that is unsettling because we've now come to see the permanence of it. So the qualities of Alicia are honesty and directness in all aspects of life. And it's therefore that I appreciate and that she wins a prize as a person just as much as as an author of a book. But there remains that I thank you for being part of this absolutely unforgettable evening. And I hope you will stay on and enjoy a little reception with us. Thank you for making this the spectacular event that it always is. And thank John Kittmer in particular for pulling it all together. Thank you. Thank you.